Hello guys, welcome back to Not Just Mecha, it's Marco here, and today we paint an entire warband using the Zorn Limited Palette. At the beginning of the year, I discovered and fell in love with the stylish agnostic skirmish rule set named Forbidden Salve, and only after a few months of playing the game, I discovered to be mentioned in the book a source of tutorials useful to catch the visual style of the setting. When the author asked me to paint something to celebrate the first expansion of the game, this video was already in production, because, well, I needed a new warband to finally play with friends after the end of the lockdown, so our conversation was something like this. Hi Marco! Yes! Wait, I didn't tell you... Yeah, sure! It's for the new... Yes, I have the models on the table! The game is set in a grim dark fantasy universe on the brink of an end of time cataclysmic event, so I decided to go for a strong Dark Souls aesthetic, using a muted limited palette based on warm earthons and an overload of textures and painterly brushstrokes to deliver that feel of a medieval painting. I imagine my heroes like a small unit of a holy militant order gone rogue in this mad apocalyptic world, and I use the tight and simple color scheme to make them look more uniform and connected, even in their extreme diversity. The models are from Bestiarium Miniatures, and their designs are perfect for the mood of the setting, so in the description you can find all the links to models, paints, and of course the game. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell button to always know what happens on the channel. And if you want to support my work, like, comment, share, watch another video, and maybe check my Patreon page, where you can find the real-time footage of my videos, with every single little line and brushstroke. Thanks a million, guys! When it comes to translating miniatures that kind of style and mood, the Zorn Limited Palette is my all-time favorite tool. That's also a great way for new painters to start playing with proper color mixing, working inside a simple and always balanced and harmonious color system. Yellow ochre, cadmium red and ivory black become our primary colors, where black is used as an extremely dark blue and source of desaturated cold sensations, and titanium white is there to regulate value and saturation of the mixes. For reasons that I'll explain better later, I'm going to use the expanded version of the Zor palette, that includes a Viridian and Cerulean Blue, for a total of 6 tones able to expand the gamut of possible mixes from this concentrated pool to something with a more balanced equilibrium between cold and warm sensations. In this video I use oil paints for the whole process, to move to the models the full visual potential and the real paints consistency of this classic palette but you can obtain a similar result using acrylics, and highly pigmented heavy body acrylics in particular, like Scale 75 Artist or Chimera Colors for example. The tones are not a perfect match of the official textbook use, but you can see how their density is quite close, and the chromatic difference is minimal, even from the point of view of the actual pigments inside the tubes, so don't stress too much about this at the beginning, and just start playing with similar colors that you have already at home. I start mixing a dark warm brown using a cadmium red, black and a bit of yellow ochre, to create my first general layer of what we can call oil primer, and I apply it directly over a standard zenithal light. As you can see I didn't use any solvent for this, and the paint is thick and dense. These particular colors have a good consistency easy to brush and spread straight from the tubes, so I don't feel the need of extra moisture, and even more important, this layer is meant to enter deeply inside every detail and little element of the sculpts, grab the surface and stay there as source of deep chromatic shadows, so here thick paint gives me more benefits than fluid liquid paint. On the bases I apply a more transparent and fluid wash of the same mix, because the natural materials used for basing have the tendency to absorb more paint and pigments, and because of their roughness it's more difficult to remove the excess, so the lighter application compensates for this increased retention. I prime the 5 models and I immediately move to the cleaning stage. I use makeup sponges to wipe off the excess, using gentle, slow, vertical passes to follow and enhance the information of the zenithal light, leaving less paint and lighter tones on the highest elements, and more paint and darker tones on the lowest parts. 
But uh, this is just a little bonus, because my priority is to keep a good amount of paint inside the details, so I'm careful in not pushing too much with the sponge, cleaning mainly the raised parts and creating a quick, automatic grease eye. This process also leaves a super thin layer of oily medium all over the models that will facilitate the flow of the next layers of paint. The blending properties of oils and acrylics are obviously different, but as you'll see, the general process I use on these models is more or less a simple layering of lighter and lighter tones, so this is the only step that is extremely and meaningfully different from an acrylic workflow. But I have an interesting consideration to make about this. Before the advent of the sprayed zenithal light with airbrushes and spray cans, a lot of painters used to apply a dark wash made of simple diluted acrylic over models primed in white to automatically catch and underline details, panel lines and general volumes, and then work inside these clearly defined shapes, like borders of a drawing. If you pause the video and study the models without a context, the visual result is quite similar to a coat of Agrax over a white primer. The huge difference is that all this paint is still wet and active, and it will interact with every new layer. But even in acrylics it's still an interesting and effective approach that can work in a lot of different situations. Like, for example, imagine applying contrast paints on top of this kind of sketch, being able to maintain the definition of the dark wash without losing the vibrancy of the transparent layer. Cool idea, eh? This is the true starting point of the proper painting phase, but with this quick step I have already in place all my dark definition and most of my shadows. All I need from this point on is a piece of paper towel, few milliliters of white spirit, my six tones on the palette, and two sets of brushes. One for the application of paint, mostly made by classic pointy brushes in various sizes, and one of blending brushes, with different shapes, sizes and consistencies, but as you can see my favorites are soft, rounded filbert brushes. In this step I simply set the mid-tones of my scheme, like painting the initial base colors with acrylics, but again, here I have an active layer of shadows inside and around every detail, waiting like a predator for new paint and brush strokes, so when I start applying new colors they instantly get an automatic modulation, mixing with the dark brown of the shadows. That's also why, from the chromatic point of view, we get that powerful sensation of a general sepia filter over everything, because that sepia tone is literally inside everything from the beginning. In other videos you have seen me using microscopic quantities of paint for each application, and later you'll see me going back to this approach for details and textures. That was because I wanted to obtain a finish closer to classic smooth miniatures, or a high level of precision and definition, but here I'm embracing a fully painterly approach, with its meaningful and often visible brushstrokes, where the first stage is a general blurred sketch of the main shades and colors, that will be refined later, little by little. Sketching the ideal, almost geometric shapes are more important than the actual sculpted details, so working on something like the OSL effect on the wizard, I just set the silhouette of the bubble of light coming from the flaming skull around the cylindric shape of the body, slapping red on everything inside its radius and letting it mix with the dark base. When I feel that the layer of paint is too thick or textured, I use a big soft brush to spread it on the surface in a more uniform way, also wiping off a bit of this excess that remains trapped in the brush. Spreading paint this way also kills the shine of thick oil paint, making it much more matte, and because the layer becomes thinner it dries faster, becoming even more matte. I keep the application of the metallic mid-tones for a separate stage, because the problem of the contamination with metallic pigments of brushes and pots that we know from acrylics is even more annoying here, because the active paint all around can easily swallow those pigments, making everything glittery and metallic. A 
As I always do, I don't really use metallic paints in their pure form, but I mix them with extra non-metallic tones from my palette to create new, more interesting shades and to tone down their shine, so I have the visual space to add metallic highlights later. These metallic tones don't belong to the Zor palette, but silver is basically a neutral grey, and bronze and gold fit into the yellow ochre spectrum, so the palette remains in its natural gamut of possible shades. This is the result of this quick, stylized application of the first layers of real colors. With a general coat applied inside borders of dark wet paint, I get mid-tones and their smooth full progression into deeper and deeper shadows, and then also into the final shadows, all thanks to their passive mixing and blending happening directly on the models. Yeah, oil paints are pure magic. And now I can start working on my lights and the extreme light definition, mostly through the use of textures. I like to invest a bit more time working on the skin, because regardless of the model, it always catches a ton of attention, and it's something really fun to paint. So I prepare multiple mixes with different tones and temperatures, and I start working with precise little dots of paint, and the more controlled flow of application and blend. Working with oils, I don't have to worry about my mixes drying on the palette, so I can prepare in advance a ton of different shades, and thanks to how the Zor palette works, creating a new tone that doesn't work is almost impossible, and every mix is always harmonious and well balanced with the others, always keeping that warm, desaturated sensation. I'm a bit more aggressive on all the other elements of the scheme, especially on the white uniforms, where I apply pure cerulean blue, viridian and white directly on the models, and then I blend them together with a single unifying pass of the blending brush. This approach creates a lower definition in the gradient that is perfect to simulate the natural flow of light moving fabric, where you can't really see strong straight edges, sharp corners and geometric shapes. The white robes are the only elements where I used the pure cold tones in meaningful quantities, and the idea behind this is to introduce a stronger contrast of temperatures with the rest of the scheme. I lose a bit of the warm soft harmony of the Zor palette, but I create an interesting breaking point in the scheme that wants to deliver a hint of their heroic past as stoic noble templars, now reduced to the dirty scrappy mercenaries of a mad wizard. On the red OSL, I simply keep adding new layers of cadmium red. Every new thin layer is more and more concentrated, and less influenced by the previous blends and mixes, and this naturally creates the powerful gradient towards pure cadmium red, that's the most saturated tone of palette and scheme. The high opacity of this red is the key to make this work. And if you try to do the same with a transparent or semi opaque color, it will never build up a strong vibrancy or real opacity. Painting red in this system, I like to keep it as pure as possible to avoid losing its powerful vibrancy in the lights, so my extreme highlight is just a pure thick cadmium red, boosted mostly by the dark value of the shadows. I add a sick greenish yellow note to the bases, with a generous transparent wash over the zenithal light and the initial brown wash, merging together all that information.
On top of these uh, first lights, I can just uh, directly paint my textures and extreme lights, and in most cases the two are literally the same thing. Working with oils, I can create a full gradient even between the most extreme values in one or two applications, so the work is really quick and simple, and the four steps of oil priming, midtones, lights and highlights flow into each other as a natural chain of events, always pushing the work forward and to its sharper final look. I steeple thick paint on the large red shield and I gently dab the effect with a big soft brush, to make the sharp lines fade just a bit into the previous layers, still maintaining most of their physical volume and the general definition. On the robes I use thin lines of pure white, to give the idea of the roughness of the old fabric, and again I can just draw sharp strong lines, because to make them more subtle and integrated into the previous gradients, I simply need to physically push them inside those previous layers, using a clean and dry brush moved on their same angle and direction, like I did dubbing over the red stippling. And, like on the red flag, I can use also a mix of both, to give the idea of a tattered piece of heavy cloth. Similar idea for the blue hat of Grandjalf, because it's kind of a grunge version of Gandalf. Sorry, I'm really sorry for this one. I treat metallic highlights like any other color, mixing multiple pools of different tones, values and temperatures. I use the darker and more earthy tones on the lower parts facing the ground, and lighter, colder hues on higher or more exposed parts facing the sky. Basically I paint through metal like I would paint no metallic metal. The work on these highlights follows the same flow of application in form of textures and soft blend, but these only where I feel the textures are a bit too obvious. The metallic shine and the sensation of little scratches it creates hides a ton of crimes, and again is quite realistic by itself, so I don't need to do much after the application. A hardcore soundtrack is always important to get into the grimdark mood. I close the work painting a couple of free hands. Even with my experience and constant practice, painting free hands in acrylics is still an absolute nightmare, so every time I want to paint a complex design, I switch to oils without a second thought, even if I'm working on something completely painted in acrylics. Even without considering the possibility of actively erase mistakes, thing that I didn't have to do here, every step of painting a free hand is easier with oils. The paint doesn't dry on the brush, so it's basically like using a super fine pointy marker. I don't have to worry about the thickness of the layers, because I'm working with a single layer and its internal mixes, and if I get to a point where I have too much paint on the model, I can fix the physical texture simply dabbing the area with a clean soft brush, so the drawing will never look like something applied on top and sticking out from the surface like a crust of dry paint. And of course blendings are simple, like in any other stage of the work. And here is the final result. Now I have a second warband for Forbidden Psalm. Now the problem is that uh, the first one is not as cool as the second one, so I'll probably end up painting a third one. <laughs> 
Painting with a limited palette is my favorite exercise, but I admit that sometimes it can be challenging. That's why it's a good exercise. But painting with a Zorn palette is one of the most uh, relaxing things I can think of. Better than floating in a swimming pool with a drink. Yep, I'm a paint nerd. After all the speed painting of the last few weeks, I really enjoyed a bit of relaxed painting with just a brush and a few colors on the palette. And I also needed to vent the Grimdark steam in preparation for some extremely clean works that I'm planning for the next weeks. Stay tuned! If you like this video, give it a like and subscribe! Remember that you can ask me anything down below with a comment and you can follow my projects during the week using one of my socials. And if you want to support my work, check my Patreon page and join the community or maybe ask for a commission. See you next week, guys!